Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional funding is provided by a generous gift from Irene Hansen who shares your passion for gardening. Additional funding by Mark and Margaret Yakel Jolene in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill. Org. Each year we know spring has arrived when the lilacs begin to bloom. Gardeners have long used the lilac as a guide to spring activities. These long-lasting shrubs have developed a reputation as a consistent indicator of events in the spring. When we see the lilac buds begin to open, we know that soon crabgrass seeds will begin to germinate. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we learn more about this fascinating shrub. Lilacs are the topic of today, and joining me is Peter Mole, University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum Operations Director. Peter, tell me a little bit about the background on lilacs. Well, Larry, lilacs are native to Eastern Europe and Asia. They grow in areas that have a cold winters and hot summers, actually a very similar climate to Minnesota. Uh, lilacs weren't native in France, but the French, uh, some of the French nobles and the French kings brought lilacs from other parts of the world and did some hybridizing in their gardens. And from there, the fr group of French hybrid lilacs were spread widely throughout the Europe and into the United States. Well, uh, yeah, it, we commonly hear the term yeah. French lilacs, and that yeah. must be where that comes from? Right. They're all, they're, most of them are based on the common lilac as one of the parents, and that's in fact some people still grow the common purple or the common white lilac, but then the, with, to get the other colors and plant forms and things, they, they breed with some of the other species. They might not be as well known. There's Hungarian lilac or, or a Korean lilac or other things like that. What kind of culture does a lilac need? Where would I put that in my yard if I was going to buy some new plants? Well, Larry, that's important to be in full sun and not in a soggy area. It should be well drained and in full sun to get the best flowers. Also, uh, they like to be neutral or slightly alkaline. They, don't, they won't do as well in acid soil. And uh, beyond that, just uh, provide them, uh, water them well when they're young to get them established, but not too much. Because if they, especially if you have a clay soil and overwater them when they're young, they'll sometimes uh, get root rot and die. Uh, it seems to me that they don't seem to do very well the first four or five years. Why is that? It takes them a while. They, they're, because they're long-lived plants, they grow an extensive root system. It does take several years for that root system to get reestablished. Even if you start with a ball and burlap plant, or especially if you start with a bare root plant, though, and during the nursery process, a lot of the roots are left in the nursery. And so it, you, know, you plant them and give them good care, and then it takes several years for the roots to get reestablished. But once they're, once they're going, they'll be with us for, uh, it could be centuries. Do lilacs need uh, a lot of fertility to grow? No, they don't. I mean, if, it's not a bad idea to give them a general purpose fertilizer like you might use on your vegetable garden every so, few years, but lots of lilacs are not fertilized at all and continue to perform well. So they do not require heavy, heavy fertilizer rates. Okay. What about um, diseases? Are there any known major problems with the lilac? Well, the biggest disease problem is powdery mildew, which doesn't really damage the plants. It's more of an aesthetic thing. But lilacs do vary, and so that's a good reason to look in some reference books, and a lot of the books will evaluate how susceptible different lilacs are to that disease, or come to the Arboretum here in Chanhassen in August and just walk through the, and look at the plants. And you'll see difference. You'll see one plant covered with mildew right next to it, a different species or a different hybrid that's, that's got clean foliage. The disease doesn't kill the plant generally? No, it's mainly, mainly on the foliage. It can weaken the plant if it has it repeatedly year after year, but it's again more of an aesthetic problem. The leaves have that kind of a grayish, uh, dusty appearance. And so therefore we'd never put this near shade? 
Well, it'll actually be worse than shade, you're right. The, uh, uh, full sun and good air circulation can help as well, not, not crowding the plants too much. Okay. What about insect problems? Do they have any major disease or insects? There is an uh, insect called a lilac borer that sometimes gets in older plants, and that, that it actually can kill, it usually won't kill the whole shrub, but it sometimes will kill some of the oldest uh, individual trunks on a lilac. And there may be some chemical controls. Probably the best thing would be is if you see it, one of, your, one of the trunks is, is declining, you can see some holes where an insect has come in or out, maybe just remove that and, and probably uh, burn it or, just, or t get it off of your property. I see. What do we got to do to keep these lilacs in good bloom each year? Well, uh, pruning is uh, not required, but it, it, lilacs will look better if you deadhead, which remains, means removing the spent blooms shortly after they're done blooming. And you cut back to, the, to a pair of leaves. That way the plant doesn't put any energy into growing seeds, and it puts its energy into growing flower buds for next year. You'd always, of course, want to remove dead wood and uh, broken branches and things uh, once a year or so when you're pruning. Uh, although it's not e required to do the deadheading, because we, we don't have time to do that here at the Arboretum, and we still get pretty good bloom on our plants. But you do, it's sort of a visual thing, again, to see those brown seed heads from last year. They can detract a little bit from the, from the flowers. In general, the best way to prune lilacs, sometimes you'll see them where people have these tall lilacs and they cut them halfway off. That just destroys the plants. I mean, that should, this just should never cut lilacs halfway back. Instead, uh, you're better off to do a, a renew lilacs over a three to four year period by doing renewal pruning, take, cutting off some of the oldest stems with a saw right down next to the ground. And then lilacs tend to, to produce suckers from the, from the root system and also sprouts from the base, and they'll send new shoots up then. You don't do it all at once. You take about a third of the oldest stems out every year over three to four years, and that way the plant will get shorter, it'll have more flowers, and it'll, uh, it basically rejuvenates the plant. Peter, we've got some beautiful blooms behind us here. How long does a lilac blossom? An individual plant will bloom for about 10 days to two weeks, but if you have several room for several lilacs in your yard, you can select the early blooming lilacs, like the hyacinth flowered lilacs that start in April usually, and then the common purple and the French hybrids bloom in the middle of May, and then you can also have late lilacs or some of the things like Miss Kim that bloom you know, later in the season. So you can extend the bloom season over almost two months with, if you have several different species and hybrids. Now, if I was going to start uh a new yard and put in some plants, what characteristics should I look for when I go to the nursery to select varieties? Well, of course, you'd like to select the lilac. It's the color that you like and, and that has some of the features you like, but, but the, the size of the plants is a big thing. And for example, you might, have to, you might want to block a view or something from your neighbor's yard or something, and you could use like the Chinese lilac, which is next to us here, which is just a, makes a beautiful screen. It gets tall, and it also has you know, fragrant flowers in the middle of May. But if, you have a, if you're looking for lilac next to your deck or patio, you might want a smaller plant, like a Korean lilac. It only gets to be maybe four or five feet tall. And so really kind of the size of the area and what's your, what your, what your landscape function that you're trying to fill. What about spacing then? Uh, how would I determine how many plants I'm gonna need in making my uh, screen? Well, the, 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 the big lilacs, you probably space 10 or 12 feet apart. But then the, the Korean, you might only plant three or four feet apart, based on the mature size of the plants. And a lot of people will plant even the bigger ones closer together because, of course, they'll fill in quicker. And that's not the, you know, the end of the world, but you probably would need to start a renewal pruning program. If you plant them a little closer together, you might just take a little extra pruning. Because as, as they grow together and they start shading, each plant shades the next plant, sometimes you get some dead wood in the, in the center. But that you know, can prune that out and it's not a, it doesn't really harm the plants. You've mentioned we've got a number of different varieties. How many different uh, varieties do we have here at the Arboretum? Well, here at the Arboretum, we have 16 species of lilacs, and then we have many hybrids, and then we have over 125 cultivars. 125 cultivars. Can we uh, look at some of the major ones and uh, point out uh, the characteristics? Uh, certainly. Let's do that. Well, Peter, if I'm going to put up a windbreak or a hedge line, would this be a species I might consider? It would, Larry. The Chinese lilac works really well for a large screen. Some of the nice things about it, it the flowers are a little smaller than the, the French hybrid lilacs, but there, there's lots of them. It blooms all the way to the ground, so the whole plant will be covered with flowers. It also stays, keeps uh, foliage down low, so it makes a nice uh, dense screen. It's fragrant, and it's a very hardy plant. I mean, we've used it, I've uh, got several a uh, thousand feet of this, I think, here at the Arboretum because it has really performed well as a, as a beautiful, fragrant screen. Well, you mentioned fragrant. Is yeah. that a characteristic of lilacs if I was selecting some varieties? Absolutely. I think most people really 
are picking lilacs partly because of that wonderful fragrance. And you can, of course, cut flowers, bring them into the house, and even have that smell on your kitchen table. But then lilacs do vary. That's another where, where it's a good idea to go to an arboretum or a public garden or even just, you know, walk around your neighborhood and, and, and smell the different lilacs. They, they all smell nice, but some have a more, you know, a more a stronger fragrance than others. What makes this a Chinese lilac versus a French lilac or a Hungarian? Well, this is actually, it's, it's really, we call it Chinese lilac as a species, but it really is a hybrid between, I think, the Persian lilac and Chinese. And sometimes the common names are not always the, you know, the best description, but it's definitely has different parents than the, the common lilac and the French hybrids. That's Syringa vulgaris. And this is uh, Syringa, it's actually Syringa ex chinensis, which indicates that it's a hybrid with the Chinese lilac. Uh, is there any unique characteristics? The leaves look a little smaller. Is that characteristic of this variety? Yeah, the leaves are smaller, and you actually get a lot more fl flower clusters close to each other. You know, I mentioned the French hybrid lilacs, the flower cluster, the individual florets are bigger, and the, f the individual flower clusters are bigger, but you don't get as many clusters right next to each other. So it really makes this a really showy plant. And it's just, uh, it's really one of the best for, uh, for a big screen. Well, let's take a look at another variety. Okay, Larry. Well, there's very many of these uh, common lilac hybrids. And this is one called Sarah Sands, where the breeder was, I'm sure, looking for that deep purple color. But it's also, if you look on the back of the petals, it has a light purple color. And so the combination of that deep purple and the light purple gives the flowers a lot of depth and texture. And just really makes it an attractive plant. And you know, it just really stands out in the landscape. And I was just smelling this, and it just has a wonderful fragrance. And I, I like the contrast between the dark green foliage and the purple flowers as well. Yeah. And this uh, plant's probably getting what? Eight feet tall, 10 feet at the yep. most? This is eight to 10 feet now, and this is actually one of the younger plants here at the Arboretum. This, this was, I think, planted about 12 years ago, and so it'll, it'll get taller, but it's still it's staying full to the ground. I always like to see flowers down near the ground instead of just having flowers on the top of a lilac. Well, the plant breeders have used a lot of different species to make hybrids. This is another plant called, called royalty. And you can see it's quite different from the, from the Sarah Sands here. It's uh, the leaves are lighter green versus the dark green. The leaves have a different shape. This looks to me like it's one of the late lilac hybrids. They bloom after the common purple lilac. So they're a different shape leaf, lighter color. And you can see this plant has flower buds that are just haven't even started to pop open yet. They're still in the tight bud stage. So it's gonna bloom several weeks after the common hybrids. And also, it's a more compact form. This looks to me like one that would be, uh, you'll fit a smaller spot in your home landscape. And it's, it's nice to have a lilacs blooming over a period of time, and also having just the contrast in the different shades of green. That adds interest then all during the summer. Oh, this will make a wonderful contrast. I could see putting that in a corner. It'd fit very nicely in the corner if I didn't need height. That's right. Exactly. Well, and I see over here we have another form, a tree lilac. That's right. A lot, sometimes people forget about those, but to really extend the lilac blooming season, and also if you're looking for a nice small tree in your yard, something is an alternative to say a flowering crab apple or a plum, so, uh, is a tree lilac. And they bloom in late June or sometimes early July. They have creamy colored flowers and they're very fragrant. It's a different fragrance from the, from the typical shrub lilacs, but it's still, it's still real nice. And they're, they're tough plants. You know, they can also be used in shelter belts and things, and they're uh, uh, they typically are trained as a single trunk, but sometimes nurseries will train them as a, a clump tree, depending on how they prune them or grow them in the nursery. And they're at a lot of, not too many plants are blooming during that late June, especially woody plants during that late June, July time period. And is it hardy in zone three, four? Yes, they, yes, they are. They're native in the northern parts. There's two species actually, the Japanese tree lilac, which is native in the northern Japanese islands, and then the Peking lilac, which is native in northern China. And they're both considered to be uh, zone four plants for sure. And I think they would even grow in probably some of the uh, more moderate parts of zone three. Well, let's go look at uh, some miniature dwarf type of lilac. Okay, they fit a whole different function in the home landscape. 